I counted eight times in the scripture, there may be more, but I counted eight times in the scripture where we're instructed to love others as we love ourselves. Love others as we love ourselves. Who, who, has anybody, just to make sure I'm in the right room, has anyone struggled with loving others at any time in your life? I want to uh, propose to you today that uh, most of the time we struggle with loving others because we don't truly love ourselves. Now, there's no scripture that just actually tells you to love yourself. It's just kind of, uh, it's kind of what is expected out of us. And if we understand that we were created in the very image of God, and we love God, then obviously we should love what God created, amen? But before you get too quick on saying, oh yeah, I love myself, then you have to ask yourself a few questions to discover if you love yourself with the kind of love that God loves with, and the kind of God love that he's given us. Because we talked about those differences. When love is mentioned in the Bible, the very first time, it's, it's, it's speaking of sacrifice, it's speaking of death, it's speaking of giving oneself, it's speaking of giving what's most important. It's, it's love that hurts. And that's the kind of love that God has given us because God so loved the world that he hurt when he gave his son to us. Jesus hung on a cross and he hurt, but he endured it because of what was coming next for us, which was the joy. He endured the cross for the joy that was before him. So the kind of love that I'm talking about is the kind that hurts. And do we love ourselves enough? Do we love ourselves to the point it hurts? And how do I know if I'm loving myself like that? Well, here's one of the main ways. Are you taking care of yourself? Are you taking care of yourself physically, mentally, spiritually? And so many times we neglect those three things. So many times it's just easier just to stroll through life and just live uh, in a kind of a, a, a lazy uh, mindset and we don't we're not on purpose about loving ourselves we're not on purpose about taking care of ourselves taking care of our minds taking care of our hearts and in proverbs it says that we should very much take care of our hearts because it's out of the heart flows life it's the it's the life of god that comes out of the heart and that's why the 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 proverbs writer solomon said guard your heart with all diligence and that's what loving yourself is loving yourself is valuing what god values so today I want to talk about that just a little bit. I'm going to open up in Genesis chapter 32 and read a very strange account to you. You've, you've probably read this before. It's very, there's some weird things that happen in the Old Testament. There's some weird things that happen in the New Testament too, but the weirdest things happen in the Old Testament. Who knows what I'm talking about? Just some strange things. Talking donkeys, flying chariots. I mean, the ocean's partying, people going through. There's, there's weird, weird stuff that goes on. And one of the weird things that happens in the Old Testament that we see a lot of is we see these angelic or godlike beings showing up on earth and they're, they're having conversations with human beings. And we see this with Abraham, if you remember the story when he was up under the oaks and he saw these, these men coming towards him, but yet they weren't really men, they, it was the Lord, right? And we see this going on and on. We see Joshua in battle and the, and the angel of the Lord comes before him and, they, and he's, he gets afraid. He's like, who are you for? And I love what he said. He basically said, I'm not here for you or for them. I'm here for, to take over, basically. I'm not here to take sides. I'm here to take over. That's the angel of the Lord. I love that. But so we have these, we have these visitations of these angelic type beings. And, and uh, uh, many scholars believe that uh, a lot of them are pre-incarnate uh, uh, visits of Jesus Christ himself. So this is where we're at here uh, in the life of, of this man, Jacob, who was the son, who was the son of who? He <laughs> <laughs> he was the son of Isaac. Yeah, Isaac. And he had, uh, he had been away at his uncle's place, gathered him a couple wives, some servants, a lot of animals, and he's headed back to meet his brother whom he had cheated out of a blessing. And uh, on his way there, uh, he starts thinking about how he's going to present himself to his brother, so he gets his family behind. Kind of, he sets he up the strategy, you know, so that He's, he's wanting to wow his brother with everything God's given him so his brother won't just massacre all of them. And even if he does, he's going to separate the family into different parts so that if he does get some of them, the rest have a chance to run, right? So this is what is going through Jacob's mind when we jump right into this scripture. And I'll read right through it, and then I'm going to, uh, just, we're going to take a look at Jacob's life for just a little bit. Okay, when Jacob was left alone, a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when he saw, did I say what scripture we were in? 24, I'm sorry, 32, 24, I'll let you go there. Or you, can, or you can read up there, wherever you like. Say amen when you get there. Amen. All right. When, then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, the man touched the socket of Jacob's thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then the man said, let me go. The dawn is breaking. 
But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So he said to Jacob, what is your name? And he said, it's Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him. So Jacob named the place Peniel. And he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Peniel, and he was limping on his thigh. Told you it was weird, right? This guy's wrestling with God. How hard is it for God to win a wrestling match? God's more interested in the process. Come on. Here's the thing. Jacob had spent his early years wrestling the wrong things. Jacob was one of twins. His mother was Rebekah. Rebekah was told by the Lord that the younger of the brothers of the twins would serve the elder. Rebekah favored, favored Jacob when he was born, and, and uh, his, the daddy, uh, he favored Esau. And if you, how many of you read the story before? So Isaac's favorite uh, was Esau, and Rebekah's favorite was Jacob. It started in the very womb. So Rebekah's like having this weird pregnancy, and she's like, what is going on in there? And the Lord said, there are two nations struggling inside you. Don't tell me there's not something spiritual about everything that's going on. And when they were born, Esau came out first, and Jacob had a hold of his heel. But it, what, I don't believe it was because Jacob was trying to get out first. I believe Esau was trying to crush him. And he grabbed his heel to stop it. This war was going on in the womb. This, this great divide that was already started. So, so Jacob has been a wrestler <laughs> since before he was born. Right? He's already got the moves. He learned them in the womb. And so, so, he's, uh, so imagine this. He's growing up in a home where he's a mama's boy. He's, he's, got the, he's got the soft hands and, and he helps around the kitchen and just not the warrior top, not the top you would think that God would use to build an entire nation upon. Right? The least likely. But we know that most, uh, we, we don't know for certain, but we can just, uh, I think we can imply this truth that Rebecca had always told Jacob, son, the Lord told me that one day your brother's going to serve under you. You're going, to be, you're going to be the head, not the tail. And I'm sure Jacob would see his brother go out and do all these wonderful things. And God, he's a great hunter. Uh, and, and he would go out and prepare the, or kill the prey and then prepare the food for his dad. And then Isaac would just enjoy it. And he just loved him. But he didn't, he didn't treat Jacob so good. But the scripture says that God, in Romans, it says that God loved Jacob and he hated Esau. The problem Jacob had is he didn't know God loved him. So Jacob is trying to do his best to find his place, all, and he's going all about it the wrong way. Does that sound familiar? Maybe, maybe we hear about the promise of God, and we, and we believe what he has for us, but somehow we think that we've got to wrestle our way into the promise. This is exactly what Jacob did with his brother. Esau, in fact, Esau, he, Esau came in one day really hungry. You probably remember the story. And Jacob's like, oh, I got away. I'm, gonna, I'm not stronger. I'm not, I'm not uh, tougher, but I'm, but I'm smarter. So I'm going to wait till he's really hungry. And I'm going to cook some of my really good swamp cabbage. And all the southerners said, Amen. two southerners. <laughs> I'm going to cook some really good lentil beans. And, and so he cooks them up and he... And uh, Esau comes in from the hunt. He's like, I'm starving. And he's like, you know, he's not really starving. I'm starving. And he goes, well, I got these beans right here. They're ready, they're ready for you. Just one thing. You've got to give me your birthright. This is the first sign that Esau doesn't care about his birthright. Because he trades his birthright for being the firstborn for a bowl of beans. And now Jacob thinks, I got it. But guess what? Jacob don't have it. Because the birthright has more to do than just deceiving, having deception. And that's what Jacob's name means, is the deceiver. 
So he's trying to finagle and manipulate his way into the blessing. And then we find that it's not long after that that, uh, that Rebekah finds out that Isaac is about to pronounce the blessing over Jacob. So Jacob goes out to, I'm sorry, over Esau. So Esau goes out to hunt the game and, um, and Rebekah calls in Jacob and says, listen, we, we got to move quick because your brother's out, he's out hunting and I'm, I'm going to cook up some real quick meat and I'm going to dress you up so you will look and smell like Esau. That's exactly what he does. And he just, and he goes from wrestling Esau to wrestling his own father. To wrestle a blessing out of his father. Instead of just trusting God that God was going to work the whole thing out, he begins this effort to bring the blessing to himself. Here's the problem. Every time, every time Jacob does this, it causes problems in relationships. Every time. All of these things, it, and I'm going to get into Laban in just a minute, but all of these efforts for, for Jacob to uh, find the blessing, to be accepted, to feel loved, all of these things end up with damaged relationships. Uh, and might, might it be that many of our damaged relationships are all because we've not truly identified who we are and we haven't been wrestling with the right person, we've been wrestling with everything else. We've been trying to get people, you will love me, right? I'm going to make you love me. I'm going to make you value me. I'm going to make you appreciate me. And all the while, the only one's opinion that really matters is the one he wrestles last. But Jacob's a wrestler. It's what he does. He's trying to make this all happen for himself. So he goes into his father, and again, living up to his name, the deceiver. And his mother's right in the mix. Puts the animal skins on him so that he's got them hairy arms. Evidently he didn't have any hair on his arms. And Esau was like a wild beast. I'm thinking, what kind of hair did that man have? <laughs> that they could clean an animal. Put the skin on him. And what kind of odor did he have? Because when he came in, Isaac said, you feel like Esau, but you sound like Jacob. Come let me get a sniff. That's what, that's, that's what happened. It's in the Bible. And he sniffed them old animal hides. He goes, yep, that's my boy right there. <laughs> Not a proud moment for Esau. <laughs> but I want you to look at what, what Jacob was willing to go through to get the blessing. To win the blessing of his father. To be loved. So what happens is his brother finds out all this. His brother shows up back in camp, has the whatever he killed. He's, he walks in with it and he goes to his dad. He goes, I'm ready for my blessing. He goes, what? I already blessed you. He goes, no, you didn't bless me. Uh-oh. The blessing's gone. I blessed your brother. So Esau says, in his own back of his mind, well, I'll just kill him. That'll end that can't rule over me if you're not here Rebecca finds out about it goes to Isaac and they send and Isaac blesses and what's interesting in the story is he doesn't even rebuke Jacob for this I, I personally believe that Isaac knew that he was supposed to come on I believe that he knew he was supposed to bless Jacob and I'm not quite so sure there wasn't something inside him that suspected that that was Jacob but it's interesting, when Jacob shows back up in the tent, Isaac does not rebuke him for the deception. Instead, Isaac just blesses him again and sends him away. But look what has happened now, because Jacob has been trying to find love, acceptance, value, through his own struggle, through his own wrestling matches. Now he is, he is separated from his twin brother. He's separated from his deceitful mother, <laughs> loving mother. He's he is uh, separated from his father, and now he is out on his own, headed to his Uncle Laban's house. How many of you know when you've got to go to your uncle's house, things have gotten pretty bad? <laughs> and Laban was one of them crazy uncles. Everybody got a crazy uncle. But on his way to Laban's house, Jacob has an encounter in his sleep at a place that he later calls Bethel. He lies down on a rock. 
and he has a dream and he sees a portal if you will to heaven and angels ascending and descending and he gets a message from god and he tells jacob i'm going to bless you everywhere you go i'm going to bless you i'm going to give you land i'm going to give you all these things i'm just going to bless you if if you'll just serve me so jacob woke up that morning and said wow this is a good place to build a church Actually, he just set the stones up and he said, this is where, this is where a port, portal to heaven is. So he called the place Bethel, which means the house of God. And then he ends up at, at uh, Laban's house. Who remembers the story? He ends up at Laban's house and, he, and he, Laban has two daughters, Leah and Rachel. And Rachel is the one that catches Jacob's eye. So he goes about getting Rachel the same way he's gotten everything else in his life, working at it, working for it. Laban sits down with him. And what's interesting is Jacob's the one that strikes the deal. I don't know why he didn't say, just give her to me, I'll take good care of her. That's not what he said. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll work seven years for her. And it says that those years seem like just a short amount of time because of his love for Rachel. So every day he's out in the field, he's working doing what shepherds do, doing what, the, what farmers do. Goes to his wedding that night into the wedding chamber. Back then they didn't have night lights so you couldn't really see the person. Sun comes up. It's not Rachel. It's Leah. That's what happens when you wait seven years for your bride. You don't even, you don't even know who she is when she comes in. <laughs> I believe in short engagements. Seven years, good Lord. So anyway, um, he wakes up and, and, there, and what has happened? The very thing that he's been doing to everybody else has now happened to him. The proverbial chickens have come home to roost. And of course, Laban has a good excuse, right? I had to marry, Le I had to marry Leal first. She's oldest and it wouldn't look good for her little sister to get married before her. We got a way of doing things around here and you should have checked with me before we made this deal. So a certain amount of days went by and he gave him Rachel too and then Laban got another seven years out of Jacob. Fourteen years he invested wrestling to get what he wanted. It's interesting that the very things that we want the most we go about the wrong way to get and a lot of times we lose what we want because we've not been willing to go through the process that God has for us. He worked another seven years. And he got Rachel. So now he starts figuring out, how can I get Laban to really give me a lot of animals? So God's blessing begins to fall on him. And you have to read the story, but there's this whole thing about the striped sticks and striped animals and polka dotted animals and all this. And Laban let him keep the ones that had the certain markings and the way God blessed him, they were all marked that way. And so in the middle of the night, in the middle of the night, Jacob loads up his wives, all the servants, all the animals, which I don't know how you move that much livestock. I've moved cows before. I don't know how you sneak out at night. I don't know how they did it. They must have been heavy sleepers or deaf. I'm not really sure, sure what happens, but Jacob loads them all up and flees off into the night, and then Laban wakes up and goes, hey, where's my daughters? And chases him down. You see what's happening here? This continual cycle of damaging relationships because Jacob does not know who he is yet. You can't love who you don't know. And when we let our past define who we are, when we allow what people have spoken to us to define who we are, when we allow our failures to define who we are, we won't, we won't love ourselves the way we should. We won't care for ourselves the way we should. And then what ends up happening is broken people attract broken people. I would give credit to the guy's name, but I can't think of it right now, but he made this statement, it's so true. He said, most relationship problems are single problems that get brought into the relationship. And all the relationship does is amplify the problems that were in the single life. So Jacob has lived his whole life just kind of struggling to make the blessing come to him. He's been struggling to get everything given to him. He's been, he's been fighting the wrong fight. Of course, Laban chases him down and scolds him. And why are you doing this to me? Why didn't you let me say goodbye to my grandbabies? Why, you know, how many of your grandparents would be upset about that? 
left hand. Yeah, like Karen's back here. Yes, that's wrong. I saw your I saw you nodding your head. So this is what brings us to this moment now. That Jacob has his, everything that God's blessed him with. He's in this place, and God shows up. And he knows there's something about this man. He knows there's a blessing. And he's going to get it. Jacob wrestled with God. And he found what he was looking for. He found himself. It's in this tension. And this is, we don't like tension, do we? It's in this middle ground. It's in this tension with God where we find our purpose. It's in this place where we don't feel right about this and we don't feel right about that and we, we, we're not who they say we are but we're not who we want to be but we're in the middle and we're like lost and we're stuck between Laban and Esau and we're not welcome either place. I've stolen from Esau. I've deceived Laban. I'm in a mess here. He only has one thing left to do, and that is to go to the one who is the one who is the blesser. In Colossians chapter 3, if you want to turn over there real quickly, I want to just bring out a New Testament scripture as I'm talking about this. About finding the hidden you. See, the, the thing is, the hidden you, you'll love. The known you, it's hard to love. But the hidden you is easy to love. Here's the thing, though. You can't discover the hidden you until you've had your wrestling time with God himself. Oh, wait a minute. I'm supposed to wrestle with God? Oh, you do. But a lot of times you just tap out and quit instead of staying in the process and saying, what are you trying to do in me? We reach out to someone. We reach out to something. And we reach out to something to escape the pain, to escape the wrestling match, to escape the one who can put our hip out of socket. And we're like, no, I don't like this anymore, so I'm going to do this. He all night wrestles with this guy. All night. Have you ever wrestled? When I was in the police academy, they had this thing called the two-minute drill. And they, they would put this dummy in front of you. No, not a person that's not smart. They put a stuffed thing in front of you, man, and they would give you a stick. And they would say, I want you to hit this thing as many times as you can, as hard as you can, for two minutes. Can I just tell you that after about one minute and 45 seconds you could have been hitting a child and that child would have been what was that what was it's nothing because you're like oh you're just falling you're just so weak because you've just expended so much energy try it sometime try to do something hard hard for two minutes that you're not used to doing and you'll find out it's not that easy what jacob did here was not easy this wrestling match he's having with god or i believe is actually with jesus He's having this wrestling match with Jesus. He's laying on the ground. I'm sure a lot of times they just lay there. <laughs> but I'm not letting go. He said, let me go. He said, I'm not letting go. I'm not. Here's the problem, y'all. We let go too quick. We just let go. And we think we're going to let go and let God. The problem is we're not going to, if we let go, we just let go of God. But it hurts. But it's hidden under the pain. It's hidden under the shame. The real you. Imagine the shame that Jacob had. He deceived Laban, he deceived his father, he deceived his brother, stolen from his brother, went to him in a time of weakness and, and uh, profited off of, off of Esau's hunger. He's loaded with shame. Shame is too prevalent in the body of Christ today. Shame off you. Off you. Shame off you. Shame does not belong to you. He bore your shame. In Colossians chapter 3. Are you there? I've given you time. Verse 1. That's easy to find. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Keep wrestling. Keep fighting. Keep seeking the things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's the you that you can love. It's the hidden you. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. How many of you know that your life is hidden in Christ? 
You know it. Well, I'm here to tell you today the only way to find it is to go through the process, to go through the wrestling match, to allow the tension between who he says you are and who you think you are to exist. Oh. Remember, it is in this tension that we find our purpose and we find his plan. How many of you want to know the, God's future for you, right? I mean, I was praying the other day, and I was like, I would just like to get in a time machine and move up a couple of years, right? That's, that would be so cool, you know? And then I would just be able to avoid all this nonsense that I have to deal with now. How many of you have ever felt that way before? Just, just the time machine. Here's the problem. The time machine would not prepare me for two years from now. I'd be the same broke, messed up guy in two years, oh, come on, that I am now if I avoid the process. And we have deceived ourselves into thinking that pain is not part of God's process. Listen, if it was a part of the process of Jesus, it's going to be part of the process with us. It's folding back those layers that life and people and circumstances have put on us for so long to find out who we really are. So many times we think, man, if, boy, if people knew me, if they knew where I was right now, if they knew what I thought, if they knew what I did, they wouldn't love me at all. Who's ever thought that before? How many people in here right now would be willing to come up here and let God show everything about your life right now in this moment that's going on right now, wide open to everybody to see? I want you to raise your hand if you'd be willing to do that. <laughs> oh yeah doesn't sound too good does it but we have a promise that he who began the good work in us will complete it but here's the thing we have to let him complete it which means we have to stay in this place that we do not like being we have to remain locked up with God with tension not understanding why we don't have what we want but understanding that he's the only one who can do what we need. Jeremiah 29, 11. I've been using this a lot, but it's good. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Who has this somewhere in their home somewhere? How about the next part? Is it in your home? Then you will call on me, come and pray to me, I'll listen to you, and you will seek and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. There's a condition to the promise. I love the promise that God has a great plan for me. I love that. I'm like, okay, let's get on with it. And he's like, yeah, but here's the thing. You're Jacob because you've been told so much about who you are, you've identified with your old self so long that you don't even know who you are. You call yourself Jacob, I call you Israel. Why do we hold on to the old? Because it's easier than wrestling with the unknown. There's a song now, I um, can't remember, I think it's called I Want to Be Different. I Want to Be Changed. And one of the things it says, I don't want to live my life stuck in a pattern. Jacob was stuck in a pattern. We can all get stuck in patterns. The only way we can get out of the pattern is to do something we haven't done yet. If our real life is hidden in Christ, if if the real you is really hidden in him, then why would we look anywhere else for it? Why do we expect people to awaken what God's put in us? Why do we think a good relationship or a healed marriage or a, or a, a, a new relationship, how, why do we think that's going to fix something? It's not going to. The feelings that come with change are good, but they always come back to the same thing. You're still the same person 
and you still have the same issues, and you can get that time machine if you want to, but that time machine's not going to change your heart. It's only going to change your place and time. We really need to quit looking for a place to do something for Jesus. We need to find the place where he can do something in us. And I have found the true change comes when we're wrestling with God in our uncertainty, in our pain, wondering where His promise is. It takes time. It takes I'm not letting go attitude. I don't understand why I'm going through what I'm going through, God. I don't know why, where, how I got here. I don't know where I'm going, but here's what I do know. You are with me. You will never leave me. You will never forsake me. And I'm going to stay in front of you. I'm going to keep you in front of me. I'm going to keep my mind on you. That's what it says in Colossians. Keep your mind set on high places and heavenly places because that's where our real life is hidden. And Lord, I don't know what it is or where it is, but I know who you are. And I know that you have a good plan for me. So my job is to keep my whole heart aimed at you, ready to change. He wrestles all night long with God. And God touches his hip. And changes his name. And in that is the blessing. He's marked now forever with a limp. He's marked now with a change name. He is now able to move forward in his life into the plan and the purpose that God had set before him because he got rid of Jacob. We, we can't live with Jacob anymore. Jacob's not who we are. It's what we've been called. It's how we've been identified. But it's not who we are. We are Israel. We can't find that truth without the tension that lies in the unknown the weariness of the wrestling with what God says compared to where we are I know he says this but I feel this I know he says this but I'm going through this I know he and we look for answers and we look for solutions we give up too quick What would have happened if Jacob would have stopped halfway through the night? He'd have just been a wore out Jacob. Still in trouble. Still not knowing who he was. But I believe Jacob got to a place in his life where he has failed every person, every relationship. He has done, come on, am I talking to somebody? He's done everything he can do. He's done it within his own power. I know mama told me this was prophesied about me. I know I'm supposed to be the leader of the clan. I know I'm supposed to be the one that's in charge. And I've been doing everything I can to get there. And nothing is working. And now I'm stuck on this middle ground between two families that neither one of them want me. And I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So when I find him, the Lord, I say, you're the one that made this promise. Come on, listen. You, you didn't call him, he called you. You didn't ask him to make plans for you, he made plans for you. This is his game. This is his deal. This is not our deal. So, the, so Jacob came to this conclusion that if I'm going to have anything in my life that that's even resembles what mama told me about, then I'm going to have to hold on to God and not let go of God until God does something in me. And I've never met anyone, anyone, who's being an Israel to the world today who doesn't walk with a limp of some sort. 
If you want to stay whole, you won't be able to make it. But if you can understand that God will use our brokenness to bring about His divine purpose, then we'll stay locked up with Him until whatever happens needs to happen. I don't know what you need. I don't know what I... How can I know what you need? I don't even know what I need. Right? I don't know what... I was asked someone the other day, I said, what, I said what, do, what do people want? And they said, they don't know. We don't. We don't know what we want. We don't know what we need. But we know the one who does. And he's asking us, are you willing to lock up with me? To engage with me? To go through the tension that it takes of not knowing, the tension of of not having the answers, to, to be able to look at someone when they ask you a question, we like being able to have an answer, don't we? So how's things going with you? Great. Like we'd like to be so great. But how about when you just say, I don't really know how they're going right now. I just, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. Where are you at right now? I don't even know where I'm at. I'm somewhere between Laban and Esau. I don't know. But I know who's with me. So you may not know where you are, but you can always know who's with you because he made a promise. I'm glad Jacob didn't let go. I'm glad he became Israel, the father of a nation, whom the Christ came through. And if we really want Jesus Christ to come through us, then we have to be like Jacob, who held on when it didn't make sense, who held on when it hurt, who held on when he was tired, I'm not talking about holding on through your self-righteousness. I'm talking about in the struggle of not knowing what God's got going on in our lives. This place of tension where we dwell a lot of the time as believers. In fact, probably most of the time if we're serving God, we're in this place of tension where we just don't understand some things. Sometimes the tension is great and sometimes it's, it's kind of minor. But there's always this tension going on because we are stuck between two worlds. We're stuck between the heavenlies, and the earthly realm. We're seated with Him, yet we're having to live here. We're having to walk through it here, and we know what He says about us there. We know we're healed, but we also know we have sickness we're dealing with. We know that we're delivered, yet we also experience bondage. We know that we are, we are rich, but sometimes we feel poor. We, we know that we are loved, but sometimes we don't feel loved. And It's that place of tension that God does the best work It's that place of tension that he touches us in a way that marks us for the rest of our life. And it changes, changes everything. See, when we, don't, when we don't know who we are truly, then we won't love ourselves because the only one you can love is the one that he created you to be. If you don't love yourself, then you have this, these things in your life when when you don't feel valued or cherished or loved, then what happens is we begin to project those feelings onto others. If you want to know how you feel about yourself, just ask your question. Ask the question, how am I treating others? How do I feel about treating others? And we're told to love others as we love ourselves. We need to find out who we are so that we can appreciate who the other person is. We'll be able to see past the Jacob and, and into the Israel that's in the person. Past what's going on in their life into what God is going to accomplish in them. Can I get amen? amen. Let's have the worship team come on up.